Dr. Coleman, today you presented the Schaefer Heathering Hoskin lecture at the Glaucoma 360. And it, your topic was the other end of the spectrum, in other words, ocular hypotony. Could you give an overview of your lecture? You know, so for my lecture, I really wanted to go into uh, what we should do with patients that have low pressure. So I started out uh, how we defined hypotony um, and showed that there are multiple definitions that are used in the literature. Um, so we did a study at UCLA where we used a definition of less than or equal to five millers mercury at least three months after a trabeculectomy uh, that's detected three times in a row or consecutively. And so I really wanted to show that when we looked at our population of primary trabeculectomies, um, how many of them had hypotony and then what happened to those eyes with hypotony compared to those eyes that had primary trabeculectomies but didn't have hypotony. And so uh, what we found at UCLA is that we had an incidence of about 2.4% of eyes that had hypotony. And so then we did a case control study with those eyes as cases. Controls were a random group of eyes that didn't have hypotony but had trabeculectomies. And we compared them and interestingly enough we found that there really wasn't that much difference um, when you looked at surgical failure. Um, that they both had um, about a similar amount of vision loss and also infection rate and also um, that they had a similar amount of blood revisions, mm -hmm. uh, which was surprising yeah. because uh, blood revision is one of the treatments for hypotony, especially when you have uh, complications with hypotony such as um, choroidal effusions that aren't resolving, suprachoroidal hemorrhages, um, lens corneal touch, you know, there are quite a few complications that can be associated with hypotony, uh, but what we found was that, interestingly enough, about two-thirds of the patients didn't have these complications, and they could actually be watched, and they did well. And over a seven-year period, they did at least as well, or maybe even better, than the patients who never had any hypotony um, three months after surgery. Yeah. You, you presented a point during your lecture regarding um, does hypotony always represent a failure? Right. Could you expound on that a little bit? Yeah, so um, what we do with uh, clinical studies, either prospective or retrospective, is that we've been defining failure by picking a numerical target of pressure and say, well, that's failure based on hypotony. And so in some studies, it's 6.5, it's 6 or 5. And so uh, one of the issues is, is that these individuals in these eyes are then considered to have failed, but actually in clinical practice, I have a lot of patients with pressures of two or three, with vision of 20, 20, 20, 25, no choroidal effusions, no problems, and so they're not really a failure. And so it's trying to get people to relook at how we define failure, that maybe just because the pressure is two or three, that's not necessarily a problem if they're not having any of the other sequelae associated with that, such as long-term choroidal effusions or um, macular hypotony. My okay. last question is, what's the take-home message for the clinician in his practice? So well, the take-home message is that um, hypotony does occur, and it can occur with a, a large frequency in certain practices. Um, when you look at the literature, it's from anywhere from 1 to 40 percent. Um, but the issue is, is just because someone has hypotony based on a number, it doesn't mean you have to do anything. That if they're able to establish good visual acuity and that they have good integrity of the eye, uh, then you can follow them and do watchful waiting, and that a lot of these patients can end up doing better um, than even individuals that don't have hypotony but have had a trabeculectomy. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. Appreciate Thank you. your time.